Well, when it comes to the relationship between the environment and our health, we often are lacking because we are not informed. And as a consequence, I think that part of democracy is imperiled. And I will return to that as I conclude my talk today about the secret history of the war on cancer. Welcome to the Miller Center Forum. Uh, as we prepare, as many of you know, for the Miller Center's national debate in Boston on this resolution, Americans have a fundamental right to health care, and it is the obligation of the government to secure that right. We're focusing Miller Center forums on some of the broader issues presented. Uh, we are distinguishing between medical care, which is what doctors and other health care providers deliver, and the broader health care, which includes medical care, but also encompasses such things as regulation of environmental hazards known to be related to disease. One of the scientists most responsible for moving the global issues of health care to center stage is Dr. Deborah Davis. Dr. Deborah Davis, who is educated at the University of Pittsburgh, Johns Hopkins, and the University of Chicago, is the Director for Environmental Oncology at the University of Pittsburgh Cancer Institute, and she is also a professor of epidemiology in the Graduate School of Public Health. Her book, When Smoke Ran Like Water, was a finalist for the National Book Award in nonfiction. Her most recent book is The Secret History of the War on Cancer, which last year was number three on the nonfiction list in Canada. We hope that it will enjoy that much success in the United States, and we're going to give all of you the opportunity to contribute to that success uh, following the forum. Please welcome Dr. Deborah Davis. Thank you so much. It's an honor to be here with you today, and I'm particularly glad to be at the University of Virginia, home of so much great thought for our nation. And I'm reminded in looking at what the Miller Center is set for its agenda of the really importance for democracy of an informed public. Uh, Jefferson wrote that democracy rests on the consent of the governed freely given and presupposes that people are, in fact, informed uh, so that they can agree to be governed. Well, when it comes to the relationship between the environment and our health uh, today, we often are lacking that freedom because we are not informed. And we are not asked to consent to exposures that we know so little about. And as a consequence, I think that part of democracy is imperiled by the failure to honor the right to know and the failure of companies to, to honor their duty to warn. And I will return to that as I conclude my talk today about the secret history of the war on cancer. And I will say, of course, what's the secret? After all, we've been fighting this war for a long time. Well, you'll be surprised to learn, as I was, <clears throat> that, of course, some secrets, the ones that little kids tell, turn out to be fabulously untrue. And we know when they're small children and they say, um, did you spill that milk? And they'll say, no, I didn't do that. Did you, did you paint on the floor? No, uh, I pretended I was daddy. But what passes as child's play can turn deadly when adults agree to keep matters of life and death under wraps and secret. And in my book, I tell the story of a number of times where that that happened. And actually, the secret history of the war on cancer is about three big secrets. The first secret is that for quite some time, a number of people understood that where you lived and worked played more of a role in your health than who your parents happened to be. Some of the causes of cancer in the modern world were actually identified clearly more than 80 years ago. I was astonished. <clears throat> when I found out uh, about the way x-rays were first discovered and become popular. November 8, 1895, the first x-ray was made. Within one month, that image, which is in my book, had appeared on the front page of newspapers in Tokyo, in Paris, in London, 
in New York. And people were holding x-ray parties, looking through bodies, with this great new technology. Within a few years, it became apparent that x-rays actually caused sickness and could lead to death. And Thomas Edison's assistant, Daly, was one of the first cases of radiation poisoning ever recorded. And it became clear as the uranium Dow painters who developed crippling mouth cancer learned that radiation could have untoward consequences, could be very damaging. So x-rays were understood almost within a decade of their discovery to be able to cause death and disease. Mining was understood to be dangerous. Even in 1556, an extraordinary book was produced in Latin with amazing woodcuts, De Re Metallica, by Agricola. This book was so amazing in its detail of the descriptions of mining that in 1912, one of America's top mining engineers did a translation of it from the Latin into English. This top mining engineer was a fellow named Herbert Hoover. He and his wife, Lou, translated this book with these de and used the same drawings from the 16th century. Underground mining had not changed that much. And we see with today's stories on the shortage of coal that we are still limited by a brutal and challenging technology to retrieving uh, what is an important resource for much of the world. The dangers of mining, the fact that mining led to lung disease, were also known years ago. The fact that tars, like those in tobacco, <clears throat> could cause cancer was also known in the 19th century and certainly proven in the 20th century. I found a report from 1936 of the world's leading cancer scientists and because it was assumed that most of the world's scientists could read German and French and Italian and English, this report appeared in all of those languages simultaneously. And it said then that the causes of cancer included synthetic hormones and mining and x-rays and benzene and asbestos. That's an amazing thing to realize. What happened? if the world scientists understood this in 1936. Well, that's the first secret of the war on cancer. Information in those days was not widely shared. You couldn't have an informed public about cancer hazards in the 1930s. I don't know if it's as widely appreciated as it should be, but the internet is fundamentally a democratizing institution. We've seen this most recently with the reports from China on the unrest and protests in Tibet that have spread throughout China. We see it in what led to the changes in the downfall of the Soviet Union as the development of the internet and the ability to share information led to broad sharing of information that would not otherwise have come out. But in 1936, there was no internet, and we were at the, really in the dark ages of sharing information. And as a consequence, the information that I talk about in my book remained secret. The second secret in the history of the war on cancer is that not every nation remained ignorant of the hazards. I was stunned <clears throat> to learn the first country in the world <clears throat> to try to ban smoking, the first nation in the world to promote organic agriculture, the first nation in the world to promote, actively promote, the use of natural products to treat health problems was Nazi Germany. There was a massive public educational campaign against tobacco. Now, it wasn't particularly successful because, like most economies at the time, the German economy depended on revenue from tobacco. But they launched a campaign, nonetheless, to forbid Aryan women from smoking, from eating foods with white flour and white sugar. Uh, and it was an astonishing indication of how some of the ideas 
that many of us think makes sense today had some nefarious roots back then. It doesn't mean they were bad ideas. It means that sometimes good ideas can come from bad people. That's a, that's a lesson that's a little hard for us to appreciate from time to time. One of the key concepts that the Germans relied on in developing their scientific approach to a healthier society was the notion of eugenics. And Virginia actually played a very important role in the development of eugenics. Eugenics was the notion that we could create a science to produce more perfect human beings. And the idea for eugenics came from a perversion of Darwinian thinking. Darwin himself was not a eugenicist, but his cousin, Francis Galton, was. And they truly believed that you could select people based on the shape of their skull or their eye color or their skin color and decide which of them would make better human beings. The support for eugenics was not held by a weird and wacky minority. It was widely shared. Oliver Wendell Holmes wrote the majority opinion in the case that had been brought by the state of Virginia, Buck versus Bell, in 1927, in which he ruled that the state was correct to have ordered the sterilization of a six-month-old baby girl and her teenage mother. He said in that decision, three generations of imbeciles is enough. He based that decision on the scientific evidence that had been amassed by leading statisticians in England and the United States which purported to show the science behind why we needed to create racial hygiene. The United States had its own office of racial hygiene before World War I broke out. And people like my grandfather, uh, who came to this country, would have been excluded if they had come through that office. Fortunately for him, he didn't. But others were excluded. And the United States of America sterilized thousands of people through government authority in the 1920s and 1930s. Hitler admired the United States policies on eugenics greatly. That's not widely known. And on the wall of the Reichstag, his office in Berlin, was a signed poster a signed photo, rather, from his good friend, Henry Ford, who was also an ardent advocate of eugenics. So Buck versus Bell was an interesting decision. It turns out to be even more interesting than many of you may appreciate, because Carrie Buck, the young girl in this situation, was not an imbecile. She was put into a home for imbeciles by her foster mother when she became pregnant. But it turned out that she got pregnant because she was raped by the son of her foster mother. That was only disclosed years later. And the child that she had, who was also sterilized at the time, was an honor student until she died of an infectious disease at age eight. Not an uncommon fate for children at that day. But the fact of the matter is, the science behind this came not uniquely from the Nazis, but came from the United States and England and other countries. There were more than 20 different nations that had laws upholding sterilization in the 1920s and 30s. Germany simply took it to the worst practice. There were many shocking things that happened as I was finishing this book, but one of them was when I sat in a uh, organic coffee shop in Jackson, Wyoming, talking to a friend of mine. And I had just discovered that the world's first organic gardens were in Dachau. And I couldn't quite get my mind around this. Dachau, as many of you know, was also the, the site of the first concentration camp in the world in 1933, announced on the front page of the New York Times that it was established to help Germany reform its political dissidents 
and those who needed political correction. It became a horror chamber. So I said to my friend, did you know that the world's first organic gardens were at Dachau? She's a woman who was born in Germany, who at the time I was talking to her was 50 years old. And she said, yes. I said, did you learn this at school? Oh, she said, oh, no. I said, how did you know? She said, my grandfather, my grandfather ran those gardens. I was astonished. She said, my grandfather was a doctor with what you would call here today a green thumb. And he really knew how to grow things. I never knew him because he died. Well, actually, what happened was he left Dachau because he said he wanted nothing to do with what they were doing on that other side. And the day the war ended, he took his family for a swim. He had injected himself with morphine, and he drowned. So the family story is, of course, that the grandfather was not a willing participant in the work of the Nazis to create more perfect people. But the reality is we will never know because her grandfather committed suicide, as did thousands of Germans, many of whom were given cyanide capsules by their own government to kill themselves. Well, war criminals, <clears throat> War criminals are those <clears throat> who have lost the war. War crimes are what the losers get charged with. The suicides in Germany presumably occurred most in those who may have had reasons to think their lives should end. It was a tragedy upon tragedy. But another, I think, paradoxical lesson of my book, The Secret History of the War on Cancer, is that when we punish people for crimes, for things that they did that were legal at the time, we create the illusion that we have actually solved a problem when in fact we have sometimes simply made it look like it should go away. The Nuremberg trials were conducted in an attempt to punish the guilty, and there were perhaps 20 physicians, a handful who, of whom were found guilty, some of them hanged. But the reality is that one out of every three doctors in Germany belonged to the Nazi party. The doctors were the most ardent advocates and supporters of what went on in Germany. And that not all the guilty ones got punished. Just as one example, Werner von Braun, was famous in the United States for his brilliant work in engineering rockets. And because of the brilliant work that he and <clears throat> more than a hundred other German scientists did, the United States became a leader in rocket engineering. <clears throat> but the place where the V2 rocket that Werner Braun first made was, made, uh, was built was Dora Nordhausen, where 20,000 people died. 3,000 were killed by V-2 rockets, but Werner von Braun was never remotely considered to be prosecuted. Shortly before the war ended, he arranged the surrender of himself <clears throat> and those with whom he had built those rockets. And there were so many German scientists in an area of Alabama that it became known as Pinamunda South. Pinamunda for the area of Germany where the rockets had first been built. <clears throat> One of the other shocking things I learned in my research was that U.S. companies actively collaborated with the enemy right up to World War II. And I tell the story of leaded gasoline. The formula for leaded gasoline was given to the Germans, the Italians, and the Japanese. And in archives that I've made available on the website for our center, preventingcancernow.org, I have records of the reports that were routinely sent back to the United States headquarters of the Ethel Corporation on the safe manufacturing of lead and gasoline for the Germans, the Italians, and the Japanese. And I show that this was done in violation of U.S. War Department orders. 
The company was told not to give the formula for leaded gasoline to the Germans, and they did give it to them anyhow. They actually created another company, Ethel Gemeinschaft. And that company helped the Germans produce leaded gasoline. And after the war, there were records that are also in my book where the Germans acknowledged that if they had not been given the formula for leaded gasoline, they would not have been able to fight the war to kill so many Allied soldiers as they were able to do. So now, <clears throat> there's a third secret in the war on cancer. And that is that even now, when we know that the environmental products, the things in our lives affect cancer, even though we know that, we continue to deny and suppress evidence on it and it becomes, it still remains difficult, it still remains difficult to establish the link between the environment and cancer. And what is secret about that? Well, I would say, I would put it this way. We began the war on cancer with the notion that we could fight a war against the disease and we didn't have to deal with the things that we knew caused it. That's the third secret. It's been the wrong war with the wrong weapons against the wrong enemies because we've been trying to find and treat the disease and ignored the things that we knew caused it. Let's look back to 1971. President Nixon declares war. Now, in fact, Governor Bilal's just reminded me that we didn't have much of a formal declaration of war many times in our nation's history. The war on cancer was not a formal war in the conventional sense, of course. But it was 1971, and we weren't doing too well in the war in Southeast Asia, so the president figured we'd fight an enemy that everyone would agree on. And there's actually some wonderful language between President Nixon and Senator Kennedy debating which one of them hated cancer more. Well, it's a noble thing to fight cancer. My colleagues who work every day of their lives to come up with ways to treat and find cancer are doing a spectacular job. We now have 10 million cancer survivors in the United States. One million of them are under 40. But we've made progress, but the reality is we have failed to address the things that we knew caused cancer in 1971. Think about this. The Surgeon General's report comes out in 1964 saying that tobacco causes cancer. Now, as I've told you, we knew that tobacco caused cancer in the scientific community in the 1930s and 40s. In fact, the Germans did the first research proving in humans that tobacco caused cancer, and experimental research showed that TARS produced cancer in the 19th century. So epidemiologic studies, public health research, on the dangers of tobacco was around in the 1930s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, and today. And yet the war on cancer starts in 1971 and it says absolutely nothing about tobacco. In 1936, benzene was clearly understood to cause cancer. And the war on cancer says nothing about benzene. Synthetic hormones were understood to cause cancer. The war on cancer only addresses synthetic hormones after a major study a very recent study shows that hormone replacement therapy increases the risk of cancer in millions of women who have been given it for a long time. Tobacco is the poster child for the story of how long it can take for a nation to act on a known hazard. And the reasons why it took so long to act on tobacco was because tobacco is an addiction for an individual, but for a nation, it's an economic dependency that is very, very difficult to, sh to get rid of. And that's why I'm really glad that Virginia has pioneered in a number of things, including figuring out ways to help tobacco farmers find other means of making money. And understanding that it, the government has a responsibility to industries that are affected by changes in public policy. But the tobacco story is also another example. It's an example of how public relations was manipulated. And in fact, <clears throat> it's not widely known that scientific community, 
was able to be manipulated as well. In, up until the 1980s, the United States government was spending $35 million to make a safe cigarette. A safe cigarette. Jimmy Carter fired Joseph Califano because he had the nerve to declare tobacco public enemy number one in 1978. So the responsibility for not acting is broad and I think can be shared by both political parties. Today we face a different kind of problem. We now have more subtle causes of cancer. There are areas where poor people have gone, come together to complain of toxic pollution. Areas of Louisiana that you've never heard of, like Reveal Town or Mossville. And the response of companies has been to wipe them off the map and pay people great sums, $35,000 or more, for their homes that are basically uninhabitable. So long as they agree to keep secret that they were paid anything at all or that they have any health claims. Now, obviously, we know the town was there one day, it's gone the next. There's a presumption of some responsibility. But we have no way to prove it in terms of the paradigm of public health research today. The tools available to us to confirm the relationship between cancer and the environment are impeded by the process that allows people to move whole towns away. I went back to visit the areas of Louisiana Delta to these empty towns and saw the grass growing over cement cinder blocks and memorial plaques that are all that's left with the names of people painted on them in red faded letters that are fading away with time. And talked to the people there who, who said it was scary to grow up as a little girl running through the swamp at night. I talked to a woman who told me about swamp devils. I said, you didn't really believe in swamp devils, did you? And she said, look, when you're nine years old and there's a huge explosion and you're running through your life in the middle of the night through the swamp, and you know there are alligators and water moccasins there, you better believe you're looking out for swamp devils. Well, the problems of pollution that I talk about in the book are not uniquely restricted to the United States. More recently in Wales, three decades ago, they found nine dead cows, and that was one of the first signs that something was seriously wrong. Those cows, it turned out, were polluted with PCBs, a persistent chlorinated compound. And it turned out that the company had known for years about the pollution and again paid people to move. So we are missing information. But as um, a number of uh, distinguished people have pointed out, the absence of evidence linking the environment to cancer should not be confused with proof that there is no connection. It often is evidence of how hard it is to get that information or a reflection of how well paid some people have been to keep that information under lids and out of our access. I will leave to later discussion with you what some of the further implications of this, of my findings are. But it's clear to me now that the sealings and signings of secret agreements impairs our ability to function in a democracy. Whether it's keeping secret defects in cars or airplanes or long lurking pollution, this is not a matter of child's play. It's perfectly legal and perfectly bad to allow health and safety information to be kept secret. Such secrets also handicap the ability of scientists to evaluate hazards. We are left with policies that perversely allow that you can't ask about what someone doesn't want you to know. So I have a solution which is admittedly not at all well developed, but a thought that I'd like to explore with some of you. We know the current system doesn't work. The Toxic Substances Control Act has been called by many of us the Toxic Substances Conversation Act. We talk about toxic substances. But the truth is, we get very little done. So my proposal is that we create a Truth and Reconciliation Commission on Toxic Hazard. And the inspiration for that comes from South Africa. 
In her memoir, Every Secret Thing, the South African writer Gillian Slovo writes that she had to struggle hard to accept the premise that people should be forgiven for killing people. Her mother, Ruth First, had been a white supporter of Mandela, who was killed by a package bomb sent by the Nationalist Party. Her father, Joe Slovo, had fought Hitler in Germany and would fight with Mandela against the white supremacists in South Africa. The last effort of his life was to seek restorative justice for the man who had murdered his wife. Gillian Slovo explained her father's remarkable position. My father, one of the architects of the final settlement, put it this way. The best revenge, he said, that I can think of for those men who murdered my wife is that they be made to live in peace in a system they had fought so brutally against. The truth-telling that this unleashed was painful, sobering, and so far has proved to have provided more healing than hurt. Those who witnessed the creation of South Africa's Truth and Reconciliation Commission call it a miracle. I think we need a miracle today, and I think we could create our own. If persons in charge of major firms today learn the chemicals their workers are using will shorten their lives, and they fail to act on this knowledge, are their actions no less morally wrong than those of the South African leaders or the Nazi supremacists? Creating a harmful workplace and concealing that harm is surely a more subtle crime than forcing young girls to serve as comfort women. But I think it's a crime nonetheless. And I think that it is one that is so widely shared that we need a process of grace and forgiveness to move on. The current system, which is highly adversarial, does not work. If we were to create a system for people to come forward with information about what they know about the dangers to their workers and communities. We would allow them to be immune from punitive damages which can run billions of dollars and have already bankrupted some industries like asbestos in the United States today. Can you really imagine that these large companies that self-insure their workers don't know if they have an excess risk of certain forms of cancer already? Now, I'm not smart enough to know what kind of system will work. I just know what doesn't work today. And I know that we've reached a time when protected trade secrets are defined so broadly that they sometimes encompass information on the health and safety of workers, including even workers' compensation claims. Those trade secrets might have cost my father his life and those of many others. But as Einstein noted in another matter, we simply can't solve the problems of the present by repeating the mistakes of the past. And now I'll conclude and we'll look forward to talking with you further about these ideas. Thank you. I'm going to uh, move to the back of the room and invite uh, those of you who have uh, questions uh, that you'd like to uh, pose to Dr. Davis to join me in the back of the room. And while I'm moving to the back, Dr. Davis, let me uh, kick off with, with this. Uh, much of the argument in your book is directed at um, the industrial establishment, the academic establishment, uh, who you say have developed uh, research information that has not been released um, to the public, dealing with worker safety, dealing with consumer safety, and so on. What do you think is the, the best cure? Uh, is it the worldwide availability of, inter of uh, information over the Internet? Do we need legislative changes? What do we need to do to, to purify the system? <clears throat> Some of the most stringent environmental laws in the world exist in China and Russia on paper. Um, laws are not people-proof. And so law becomes a tool when you have the resources to implement it. But right now, uh, it's not widely appreciated that the federal budget is a profound instrument of public policy. And if you don't want to enforce the law, you can have a signing statement. Or you can not fund agencies so that they have adequate resources to monitor and enforce the law. The Consumer Product Safety Commission is a recent example. 
where we've had imports of defective products from China, um, the USDA, where we've had imports apparently of uh, defective dog food that has led to the deaths of dogs and cats. So if, if you have laws and you don't have the resources to enforce the laws, um, that's not going to work. And that's why I think that this idea of a Truth and Reconciliation Commission will be important because there are many instances in, in history where people have done things that are perfectly legal but immoral, as we discussed just before. Uh, slavery is an example. Slavery was legal, um, but it was wrong and judged to be wrong. And as we, we have to make a transition away from the, those times and understand that, as uh, the cartoon character Pogo might have said, we've met the un enemy and it is us. Uh, it's not that we have a, an us or them situation. We are all responsible for this current situation and we're going to have to work together to figure out a way out of it. You were talking about eugenics, and I think about uh, the Virginia situation, which uh, recently there have been apologies through the General Assembly for that program, and the same thing with the German uh, set up on eugenics as well. And yet I think about one thing, and that is Darwinism is still with us, and uh, we have an understanding that people are different, and there are people who are resistant to disease, who are resistant to cancer, and there are people whose families seem to be the same way. How do you uh, sort of feel about this whole idea? Well, th that's, it's a tough question, and, and I think that um, I'm not really smart enough or well-informed to address all of the nuances. There's no question that there are genetic differences among us, but let me tell you something most people don't appreciate. One in 10 cases of childhood cancer and one in 10 cases of breast cancer occurs in a person who has inherited a defect in their genes. Only one in 10 cases. That means that nine out of every 10 people with cancer are born with healthy genes and something happens to them to give them cancer. So in that case, we know the majority of cancer and I would say the majority of our health problems, frankly, is not inherited but results from acquired damage that happens to us in the course of our lifetimes. I report on work with identical twins that come from one egg fertilized at conception into two nearly identical embryos. They develop and their chromosomes look the same at age three, but by age 50, they look totally different from one another. And that's an indication that genes give us the gun, but the environment pulls the trigger. So it's important for us to understand that even though genes explain some of our diversity, they explain far less of it than we think. And certainly for African Americans, it's not about genes so much as it, about, as it is about the social and economic conditions. Why we have one in eight Americans that's black, but one in three who works in an industrial job is black, one in two who works in sanitation is black, so when you talk about the greater health burden for blacks in this country, you have to look at the social and economic circumstances. I think it's far too easy to focus on genes as though we are simply determined by our genes when it's the interaction between genes and the environment that's important. And because of that, because it is that interaction, I think we have to pay more attention to the environment because you can't go back and pick your parents and the environment is more important than inheritance for many of our health issues today. Hi. Um, I, my question is, you're talking about the development of a truth and reconciliation process because of the cost of the, um, the, the, the regular route, which is um, through law, through cases. Um, I'm wondering if you, can, if you can tell us about the number of successful legal cases that have been fought, where people have succeeded in pressing their claims? Well, th that's a rapidly shifting uh, situation. The Dolbert um, decision of the Supreme Court is probably the most influential Supreme Court decision most of you have never heard of. It basically created a very, very steep um, set of criteria for proving causation. And uh, I go into it in some detail. Let me just suffice to say that 
right recently, 90 percent of all cases brought by plaintiffs in the tort bar have gone for the defendants against the plaintiffs. And that's not an accident. That's a, that's a result of a very deliberate effort to make it harder and harder for those seeking recovery from toxic torts to gain that recovery. And it is now harder than ever. Um, it is true that there have been successes in the case of toxic torts. I would dare say that most of them are in the past. It's true that there's a general movement away from that. There have been class action lawsuits in the case of DBCP, which was a pesticide that was banned in the United States but widely used in Latin America, where 20,000 men were rendered sterile and where uh, they ultimately received a $50 million settlement, which for the companies involved was not that much money. But for all of those uh, successes, and I think most of them are in the past, the world of litigation has become a, a much more difficult one in which to prevail on behalf of those who seek to receive compensation for toxic damage. And the Dolbert decision and other decisions have changed the nature of evidence that can be accepted now by the courts. And I don't think we're going to see much much change in that. And there have been extremes on both sides. There have been frivolous lawsuits and there have been those with extraordinary um, results as well. I think that the incentives now have, have to shift because there, pollutants don't need passports. And those at, people at the top and those at the bottom are equally vulnerable to some of the pollutants that we have in our lives today. And I think that We've reached a certain maturity as a society, as a civilization, I hope, where we can do better uh, by coming forward with this information. And I would hope that the offer of uh, being exempt from punitive damages might be attractive to certain industries and allow them to come forward. If they agree to tell us what they know and to accept responsibility for medical costs, which they have for their workers anyhow, uh, and for the communities that may be affected, then they wouldn't be subject to billion-dollar um, damages as well. It's obviously just an idea that needs a lot of work, and I would welcome those of you who have interest and expertise in um, giving me further advice on it. The legal remedy is only one of a number of ways in the political structure that we can make things happen. And I'd like to ask your opinion about the role in the past and the role in the future of new forms of, of civic engagement or political mobilization. Um, certainly the environmental area has seen more of that than other areas. And if you look at one of the um, essential features of uh, essential services of public health now, it is social mobilization. So there's this new recognition, I think, um, growing that we need new mechanisms because legal mechanisms are too cumbersome and you have the evidentiary issues you dealt with. So that some things proposed are civic juries, um, uh, engaging the, uh, the pol politics at the local and state level in different uh, mechanisms and there are a lot of opportunities in different ways. But what is your vision of where we can go with that. Is it, is it useful? Is there hope? Well, um, I'll, I'll, uh, of course there's hope. I'll, I'll tell you a, a joke from uh, Israel from uh, about 10 years ago. Um, it, 10 years ago in Israel, it took about three years to get a phone when you needed a landline, right? So a person's calling saying, um, look, I really, really need this phone. I really, really need this phone. It's really, really important. Um, the guy says, well, it's going to take 10 years. He said, 10 years? Is, is there no hope? And the answer is, of course there's hope. This is Israel, but there's just no chance. <laughs> well, I'm a, I think there's a lot of hope, and I think you're absolutely right. And, and I, th I thank you for adding those um, and comments about civic engagement and recognizing, I think, the limits of a system based on a, a punitive structure of, of, of the law. Um, I'm married to an economist, as some of you know, and uh, markets do work, particularly small markets and local markets. And I think that we're seeing a fundamental change now through the market system when it comes to personal care products and cleaning products. Um, the concept I'd like to talk about is girl cots. Now, a boycott means no. 
<laughs> we won't buy your grapes if they have too much pesticides, if our workers are exposed. But a girl caught means yes. Now, women today spend 85 cents of every dollar that's spent in this country. 85 cents of every dollar. You would think we would, might have a little bit more control of some other things, but we are responsible for what goes into our homes, gets put on our bodies, and into our children, for the most part. And girl cots mean we create markets, and we say we want to buy safer materials in our gardens. We want to buy safer products for cleaning our homes. We don't want to have to be a chemist to know whether or not there's a carcinogen in that shampoo you're selling me or that bubble bath I'm going to put on my baby's bottom. We demand the right to buy safer products, and we are going to use the power of the purse to get those products. And the fastest growing sector of the economy, whether it's in transportation or construction or retrofits or products for cleaning, is those things that are going green. Now, there's a lot of greenwashing going on. You've got to be careful because, for example, simple green is not simple, nor is it green. <laughs> But we see this tremendous shift in the market now, where people are demanding the right to buy cleaner, healthier, more efficient products, and girl cots are leading the way. Having said that, I have to brag about some of my local girls at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. We have a number of women who head up our hospitals. Leslie Davis and Liz Concordia both run two of the largest hospital systems in the country. And they are committed, as is the entire University of Pittsburgh medical system, to going green. Now, what does that mean? It means we're getting rid of toxic cleaning products. It means we're using non-VOC paints. It means we're doing a wholesale examination of our energy tra and transportation system. And as a consequence, we're going to reduce the ecological footprint of the hospital system. And our hospital is not one building. It's 400 different major medical centers, clinics, and offices throughout five states and four countries. Now, if that's happening in, at the University of Pittsburgh medical system, it's, it's also a sign of how much social engagement is happening. If you look at the Fortune 100 companies, and they keep shifting now with all of these crises, those that have the clearest mandate and direction on sustainability, those that are following the equator principles, are doing better than companies that are still struggling with the old technologies. Um, my question concerns um, how the government would respond to information that you find about toxic environments because um, an economist might think um, that individuals place a finite value on their lives and that they choose to work at a firm that incurs higher health risks uh, and in, in doing so they'll, they'll achieve a higher pay for doing this. Um, for example, a coal miner. Um, how do you respond to an argument like that where um, there are toxic risks an individual is aware of them and chooses this environment for their own benefit yeah. monetarily. Yeah. Well, ch choice is a, is a very tough concept, and I know the economics literature um, has a widely developed body of studies on the willingness to pay and the, the people assuming risk of, of, this, of this sort. Uh, it's not a literature that I'm well-versed in, nor one that I particularly like. Um, perhaps the two are related. Um, I, I have to give you a quip from Bertolt Brecht. If the government uh, doesn't like the people, then perhaps it ought to elect itself a new people. <laughs> but to be serious about, about your question, I believe that we in the scientific community have an obligation to provide information about risks of employment to industry and to workers so that they can work together to reduce those risks. Uh, I grew up in a small town of Denora, Pennsylvania, where in one five-day period of time, 20 people dropped dead from air pollution. 1948, Denora, Pennsylvania. Most people have never heard of it, and that's why I wrote my first book, When Smoke Ran Like Water. Half of the town worked for the mill, and the other half worked to take care of those who did. If you had told them that the mill itself was responsible for poor health, that the mill explained why so many women in their 40s and 50s had heart attacks, it would have 
created, a, you know, a real Sophie's choice, if you will, a, a Faustian bargain. And those bargains are what we have to work to, to reduce. We have to reduce the situation where people get to choose between a long life and a good life. And that choice is one that is not always possible for people to make. In China today, the best paid steel workers are those who work on top of the coke ovens. We know what their risks are, and they know what their risks are. And one might argue that they're willing to accept those risks, but they don't really have a, a real choice. Uh, they don't have the opportunity to move. And so I think we have to work together to see that modern technology becomes shared as widely as possible to reduce the burden that is now so inequitably distributed so that there will be more real choices. Thank you for uh, enlightening us about so many of these things. Um, I'm Phyllis Cott Sherris. I'm a clinical psychologist. And over the course of my doing uh, therapy, I've seen uh, several people who have been whistleblowers. And I wonder if you could speak to that. They've had such a terrible time of dealing with the repercussions of doing that. And I wonder if you see um, what, you, what you see happening with that and what we maybe can do to protect them as well as protect the companies in your plan from yeah. their... You know, that, that's, that's, that's a very tough question. I'm not, I'm not sure I can do it justice in, in a short period of time. I've also had some very close friends who have um, developed some very difficult personalities because, you know, it's, you're not paranoid if they're really trying to kill you. <laughs> right. And it, certainly those who have blown the whistle on, on, on problems in the past have paid very dearly. Uh, again, um, and I think that, you know, I've been accused of being an optimist and I plead guilty. Uh, it's easier uh, to assume the best and prepare for less than that. And the, the Internet, again, and the ability to get information today has so transformed our lives that it becomes easier for people to assume the mantle of the whistleblower because it's, it, there's more information, it, it's more available um, out there. But I recently met with senior scientists at a government agency that I cannot name um, who told me that they are really looking forward to the fresh air that is expected to come again um, to this government. And I think it's hard to overstate the chilling impact on science that this administration has had. There's an excellent book by Chris Mooney on the Republican War on Science. And I have many colleagues who are superb Republican legislators and scientists, um, and they are as appalled as the rest of us at some of the manipulation of information and the withholding of information that has gone on now. I think we will soon look back on this era as worse than McCarthy in terms of what it has meant for scientific freedom. And that's a price that our society should not be forced uh, to pay. And I suspect that the voters will soon be putting an end to it. Oh, oh, I just want to ask uh, your opinion on like uh, genetically modified food, and uh, do you think we should like label it or? Uh? The issue of genetically modified food is not one that I'm an expert on. Um, I do think that there are appropriate uses for genetic modification, and I'll tell you one that we're doing in our studies at the Center for Environmental Oncology. You can genetically engineer an experimental fish that's about this big, so that when you put it in the water it turns color if there's pollution. I think that's a pretty good use of genetic engineering. And I would like to see genetic engineering restricted to scientific uses like that, frankly. But I'm really not an expert on the, on the food issue. And I do think that there are opportunities to create um, foods that we might not otherwise have. I am concerned with the um, Terminator seeds and other things that have, have been developed, but I'm not really an expert on, on that issue. Uh, you have spoken of the precautionary principle, which is apparently used more widely in Europe or in the EU than here in the US, where we have a prove harm for introducing materials with potential toxic effects. Could you explain a little bit more how the precautionary principle might work in our country? 
Well, I can tell you briefly that the European Union has, has passed legislation that is just being implemented now called the REACH program, which is the re-registration, evaluation, assessment of, uh, of chemical hazards. And that program is, is requiring them to re-examine um, and demand data on the relative safety of materials so that the question is, chemicals are, are not assumed to be innocent until proven guilty. We have a system in the United States today where unfortunately less than 10% of all chemicals widely used in commerce have been subject to full toxicological testing. And as I say, there is no incentive for that testing to proceed right now. There is none. So that's why we have the problem. The approach in Europe is based on the precautionary principle, it's better to be safe than sorry. But what that will actually mean in, in execution remains to, to be determined. I, th I think it's, it's a welcome development, it's, it's refreshing, and I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing how it will be implemented. The importance of health care as a uh, really an overarching issue uh, in this political year uh, is one that the Miller Center is, is recognizing and trying to address, and we are deeply grateful for your contribution to our conversation. Thank you. Thank you.